Recently, we've been tinkering with 3D printed plastic injection molds in order to make building blocks, fishing lures, and all sorts of random parts at home. A common issue that we kept running into was our molds letting all the plastic ooze out in between. So why does this happen? Well, it's because these molds are made of 3D printed material, which is plastic, and hence is somewhat flexible. So how do we prevent this? In today's video, we attempt to make an aluminum housing using our DIY CNC machine, which will hold both halves of our molds without letting them flex. That's the idea, at least. The first step is to design a general pocket shape, and quite honestly, I just chose this rectangular shape arbitrarily. Next up, let's make these. All right, so we got this raw material from our local metal supermarket, and these are just two by four by six inch blocks of aluminum. Now we're gonna process these on our DIY CNC machine, which you can see right here behind me. This machine's about a year old and has been holding up really well. We've been cutting aluminum, steel, and even stainless with it, and today you're gonna get to see it in action at the action box. So let's get started. Our first step was to manually insert our three axis Hamer edge probe, which is my absolute favorite CNC machine tool because it helps me find my origin in no time. So the protocol goes like this. We probe the side of the aluminum until the dial arrow hits zero. Then we zero the X axis on our screen. Now we probe the other side of the x-axis and divide the difference by 2. This gives us the perfect center of our aluminum stock in the x-direction. Do the same for the y-minimum and y-maximum of your stock, and then when you jog to x0, y0, you are perfectly in the center of the block. Now, we just zero the z-axis the exact same way, and well, we're ready to rock and roll. So for our first set of tools, we use these drill bits to make our clamping holes. We also have the flood coolant running the entire time in order to prevent the aluminum from overheating and gumming onto the drilling or milling bits. Now, the first drill bit we use is short and stubby to keep the hole straight. The second drill bit is longer, so it penetrates deeper and opens the hole to the desired diameter. Great, our machine is now wrapping up the drilling cycle, so once it retracts, we can insert our carbide three flute aluminum cutter, which for the record is my absolute favorite cutting bit. This end mill just rips through aluminum. Now if the pitch ever changes to this, then you know that you have aluminum hair stuck on your end mill. A quick trick to get this off automatically is to spin the spindle in reverse really fast, which nicely gets the job done. I found that 6,000 RPMs or higher to work the best. So let's clear that surface off with a brush and march onward. With the pocket complete, we face the top of the part just to make sure that it's parallel to the features of our pocket. This also just gives the part a really cool machined look, so why not? Our last step is to break all sharp corners with a chamfer bit, followed by cleaning off all the coolant, and voila, our part looks perfect. So we put the second piece of stock in the machine, and 15 minutes later we have both of our completed mold halves. We also have a ton of this leftover CNC scrap, so we can wash them off with water and then use our super simple DIY foundry to recycle them into a usable block of aluminum. Feel free to check that video out on our channel. And now that we have our two aluminum blocks, let's get started on creating the actual 3D printed molds. Since we'll be dealing with resin, it's important to use gloves. We begin by pouring in this resin from Soraya Tech, making sure not to go over the max. It's also a good idea to confirm that our 3D printer is more or less leveled. So we grab the USB with the file to print, select our file, and then we just press start and wait about three hours for the prints to complete. I do want to thank Soraya Tech for sending us this resin. We've tried a bunch of their engineering resins from their nylon-like to their flexible materials, which we got from either their website or Amazon. The best resin for this application is the Sculpt Ultra Resin for its high heat deflection temperature, or in other words, the temperature that a plastic will deform under a certain pressure, which makes it the best choice for 3D printed plastic injection molds. Their resin is definitely high quality and their customer support is also really good, so I would definitely recommend them. Alright, we need to wash our molds with isopropyl alcohol now, so we pull out our trusty little Creality washer and use this little metal basket to throw our mold halves into. We like to run the cleaning for 10 minutes with this resin, and while it's running, we quickly reinstall our print bed and cover the printer to prevent any hairs or dust from settling on the resin and later getting into our print. Parts are now all washed, so let's throw them in the same chamber to cure. You don't want to over-cure these or they can become more brittle, 
So we like to use around five minutes with this resin. And here we are. The mold halves turned out really nicely. And the best part is that we can make a bunch of them. So we grab our prints, go to push them into the cavity, and of course, they don't fit. Not easily, at least. This one here seems to be even worse. It won't even start going in. So I grab the calipers to confirm the sizes of the parts and cavity, and well, they are both bang on. So as we said in previous videos, if it doesn't go in with force, use more force. We take these over to the hydraulic press. Now we risk breaking these here, but they're garbage anyways if they don't fit. Why? Well, because it's easier for us to just print a new mold in three hours instead of fooling around with grinding this one down. So we load up the aluminum cavity, place our first part inside, and then use this piece of metal on top to increase the surface area that we're going to be pressing on. Our external microphone stopped working here, so we apologize for the lack of sound. But the first part pushed in with no problem. It pushed in really smoothly, actually. When we take it out, we can see that there are no defects or cracks in the plastic, and it also sticks up above the aluminum cavity just a little as intended. So this was a great success. Now, we have our second cavity to push our mold into, but we really don't want to press on the tip of the mold. So we thought about covering it with one of our injected parts, but somehow that felt like a bad idea. So, new concept. We grabbed these shaft couplers from our shreddy video, but they were too tall unless we can take this bed and move it down. Luckily, that's no problem with our Harbor Freight Shop Press. We restacked all of the components here and started to press. Right off the bat, we heard cracking and noticed this break at the base. Of course, at this point, we just wanted to test these out already, so we forced it in all the way, which is never a problem with hydraulic presses. If you want something to go in, with these presses, it's going in, but not without problems. Turns out the entire top of our mold broke so we need to redesign the mold to be a little smaller and also remove it from our aluminum cavity. So we got our vise, loaded the package inside, and started hammering and drilling away at it. After a bit of cleanup, we managed to get out our part, and yeah, we kind of damaged the bottom of the cavity a little, but that's not a big deal. Why? Because you can either make more by yourself or reach out to PCBWay. These guys are my absolute favorite to work with because I just upload my part and get an instant quote. They've never failed me and they always send me high quality parts. They also offer great customer support. So if you have parts and you don't know where to get them made, reach out to these guys, they're great. We printed out our new piece, which is slightly smaller and it fits in much better. We're still going to take it to the press to push right here and make sure that it's fully seated. You can see that we have our injection hole and the injection site at the back and those two are lined up perfectly. All right, so there's our part. It fits in pretty nicely. Now we just take the other side and close it. You can see we have a bit of a gap in the aluminum, which ensures that all of the sealing action occurs at the plastic molds. The last thing we need to do is tighten these together with quarter 20 screws. We're careful not to fully tighten any of these screws until we're done inserting all four of them. Otherwise, what we can get is a bit of a shift in angle in this line, and that's not what we want. Now that they're all in, we're not really sure how tight to make them. So let's go with about a quarter of a turn on each. Always tighten the counter screws first, just to prevent, again, this piece from getting too tight on one side and then having too much of a gap on the other side. All right, I'm not sure if that's tight enough for the two molds, but let's put it in the injection machine and if we still get flashing, we'll try to tighten these even more. And we'll just keep doing that until we either have some success or the molds fail. So we plugged in the machine and turned it on. We then waited about 10 minutes for it to heat up. Once it was ready, we brought our molds over, as well as the scissor lift that we used to press the mold up against the nozzle. It's important to remember to fill the machine up with plastic pellets. As always, we place the mold on the lift and elevate it until the nozzle has a very tight fit around the injection orifice. And that's it, really. We press the two injection buttons, which were designed for safety, and when the cycle is done, we can see some evidence of plastic being injected. We were quick to open the mold and see what we have. And well, we have a pretty promising looking short shot. What that means, as you can see, is that the plastic did not fill the entire volume of the cavity. So we're going to try again in a second, but first, let's extract this part by pushing on it from the back. We used this random punch we had lying around, and it worked great. But our part was still stuck in the mold, so we tried to grab the mold directly on the vise, and this worked. 
But do you see how the part has already detached yet it's still stuck onto the mold by the sprue? This is why you want to put a taper on the injection hole. You would want to use a taper drill bit like any of these ones here to make that hole. Right now, when we push the part out, it's still stuck in the barrel by the sprue. But with a taper, if you push it out just 50 microns, then it will completely detach and come loose. I hope that makes sense, but if it doesn't, hopefully someone can do a better job explaining it in the comments below. We can now break the sprue off, and there we go. So now, we want to try to do the same thing but with a full injection. Oh yeah, this feels like a good one. We'll pry it open with a screwdriver. We got a little flash, so we need to adjust our injection volume. But this is way better than our old molds, if you remember those, where we got excessive flashing while not using the aluminum backing. Now, we went to remove this part from the back and found a neat trick. Note how when we tried to extract the part, the entire plastic mold shifts out of the cavity. If we can clamp both of these sides onto the aluminum base, then we can get the part out in one go. We get much better injections if we control our injection volume with our clamp. But even if we get flash, it's easy enough to get it off with an X-Acto knife. This has proven to be a great method for easily making some parts at home in mass if a 3D printer takes too long. In our next video, we're going to try to make the same part out of molten aluminum using the same 3D printed molds. So if you want more of the action box, hit that subscribe button down below. We hope you learned something from us today.